So listen, we're going to go ahead and read Revelation chapter 13. We've been, we've been working through the book of Revelation. We started an end times teaching. I mean, we've been in this for months, you know? And we started in other areas and we went through, we've gone through a lot of information. And the reason why I believe that it's so important for us to spend time on this, because you know, there's even modern day preachers, I'm not going to start off by calling people out, but some of the more popular, well-known preachers out there that have written books that have been well bestsellers and have sold millions of copies actually have made comments and say, you know what, you don't even need to worry about prophecy, you don't need to worry about end times teaching because, you know, God doesn't want you focused on that because, listen, you need to have a purpose-driven life. Yes. Can I tell you that? Do you have a purpose-driven life, sir? Can I tell you I have a purpose-driven life? And the purpose that drives my life is to live and, to, and for my life to give glory and honor to my king. All the other things. And listen, it took me a while to get to this place. This didn't happen overnight. God had to convince me against myself. You understand what I'm saying? I'm like a two-year-old toddler kicking and screaming and saying, No, God, I don't want to go that way. I want to do what I want to do. But guess what? The Lord is gracious and merciful. And if you're willing to say, Lord, I want you and I want to walk according to your will, I'm telling you right now, he won't let you go because he knows when you need business with you. Amen? Yeah. And so uh, along that journey, I've come to the conclusion that that is, my, that is the driving purpose of my life. Hey, I'm playing on words, but I'm trying to make a point. That is the driving purpose of my life. And it is to give glory to, and honor to my king. Because let me just tell you this. I'm convinced that he's real. I'm convinced. Yeah, you're going to tell me nothing there. I almost went off the other night in the hospital when I was working as a nurse practitioner. Because it's a long story. But one of these doctors said, oh, my gosh, you're going to die. You're gonna die. It's a reason why he said that. I said, I don't fear death. I don't, I don't fear death. And, you know. We were busy with a sick person, so I didn't have time to transition, but maybe the next time the Lord will give me the opportunity to transition. There's a reason I don't fear death. The reason I don't fear death is because I serve Jesus, and he is the resurrection and the life. Amen? And, and if I die in Christ tomorrow because of some unforeseen thing, guess what? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What are you saying? I need to go kill myself? Come on, man. That's against the will of God. No, of course I wouldn't tell you to do that. That doesn't, that's, that's, that's lies, and, and that's the lies of Satan. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that, I, and I was thinking later, when I was thinking about when I told him that, I have this old song that we used to sing in the church. Ain't no grave gonna hold, I can't sing, but there ain't no grave gonna hold this body down. Huh? Amen. Coming up out that grave, I don't even know how it goes, but you get the point. Ain't no grave gonna hold this body down. Why? I'm gonna tell you all. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Amen. Hallelujah. And I have put my faith in him. And he died for me, and he died to pay the penalty of my sin. Amen. And because listen, you know what the word of God says? He had no sin in him. You, you understand that? See, the wages of sin is death. And so therefore someone had to die. But it couldn't be you and it couldn't be me because I had sin and you had sin. So God became man without sin and he died on the cross for my sin. Amen. And because he had no sin, there was no grave going to hold his body down. Amen. And he came busting out the tomb after the third day. Praise God. And you know what the word of God says? That because he rose from the dead, I too will rise from the dead. Amen. That's the power of the gospel. I need you to know that. Do I believe it? You better believe I believe it. I believe a lot of things about God. Amen. I mean, I look at it. That, that, that message the other day stirred my faith. Amen. Like, I, know, I mean, listen, I just want to go off on this right now. Maybe we'll say something Sunday. I know everybody didn't receive their complete healing. I know everybody didn't get filled with the Holy Spirit. But guess what? I believe some people did. I believe some people got filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe that God, maybe sometimes he heals right away. Sometimes he heals piece by piece, minute by minute, as we continue to believe him. But I'm telling you right now, the Holy Spirit, look, we got to start having an attitude of faith. Amen. That's it. See, I believe that this world's going to come to an end and that Jesus is coming back for his bride. I, I'm convinced. I believe that Jesus died, and because he died, I am going to be able to spend eternity with my Father. But I have also believed that God has set me free today to walk in victory. And I believe that if I will proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, that the gospel, like a seed, will be planted in somebody's heart, and it will produce a harvest. Amen. 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 And just like I believe that there's a God, I also believe that there's an enemy of God. Amen. And he's a 
against God. That's right. And he's against you. That's, right. yeah. That's the problem. That's what's playing in your life. I'm talking about whoever you may be, whether you're on video, whether you just walked in tonight. I'm just here to tell you right now. That's what's playing in your life. Psychiatry and and, and, and and the addictionologist. What you know about addictionology? I'm going to tell you what I know about. I had to go see one when I was about 23 years old and wanted to get my nursing license because of my past. And they said that if I didn't go see an addictionologist, if I didn't prove that I would admit that I was this and admit that I was that, I was never going to be able to have a nursing license. And I tried to reason with this man that had all these degrees and he didn't have no time to sir. If you robbed houses, if you did this in order to get drugs, then you're an addict and you'll always be an addict. But I'm here to tell you right now, that's not what the Bible said. The Bible says that I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. This ain't a AA show, my friend. This is about Jesus Christ dying on the cross. And guess what? Old man Matt putting his faith in Christ and the old Dying with him, being buried with him, and resurrecting the newness of life. What you're looking at today is a new man. Amen? Amen. Right. Amen. I know it looks like I'm getting older, but I'm telling you right now, I'm a new man. <laughs> Amen? Praise God. All right, that's just a little, that's the prequel. All right, so let's go ahead and read Revelation 13. Let's read it. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, which is also three Point five years, which is half of seven, which is 1260 days. It's half of the seven year period of the end that the Bible prophesies will come in the end. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man has an ear, let him hear. He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he does great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is... Six hundred 
3 score, which means 60, and 6. So the number is 6, 6, 6, right? So the, the, me the message that I'm going to, uh, that I titled today, tonight's message, uh, as we're talking about Revelation 13, I titled it, The Beast, The False Prophet, and His Flame. All right. So listen, as we move forward in here, before we get started with some of these next scriptures, I just want to kind of like bring you back to where we've been a little bit. I don't want to overdo that. I don't want to take up a lot of my time. But we have come together to talk about many things. And in this end time series, one of the main points that I really wanted to get across was I, my desire was to show you through the scripture that I do not believe that the Bible teaches a pre-tribulation rapture, okay? And I'm going to explain to you why I think it's important that I say that tonight. Okay, I personally believe that I have more than proven that already, all right? Now, I'm not even done yet. I haven't even unveiled 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'm about to unveil that next week. If you haven't been with us, you need to go back and you need to watch all of the videos, because I'm telling you right now, I'm not talking about something that I woke up after eating pizza. I'm talking about something that I said, you know, people say you got weird dreams when you ever eat pizza. What I'm trying to say is, is that I'm talking to you about things that I dissected out of the Word of God. And you may not completely agree with me on that, but what my point is, is that I've done the work, I've done the homework, and I did my very best with the help of the Lord to reveal that to you. Why do I feel like that is so important? Well, part of it is things that I've already taught you, but I'm going to review it real quick. That number that I've mentioned and shown on the screen multiple times, 1,335 days, that comes out of Daniel chapter 12. Because if you take that 1,335 and you, tr and you take that 1,335 on the last seven-year period, then it goes about 75 days past the midpoint. And it's at the midpoint that the Antichrist that this chapter is talking about reveals himself to the world. Why is it important that people would maybe know that this is a possible possibility in the Word of God and that it's not automatically, oh, you believe in a, in a mid-trib, in an in a inner seal, in a mid-week rapture. You don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. You're a heretic. We're turning you off. Okay, well, what if, what if it's not heresy? What if it's the truth? And what if others have been deceived that have gone before and everybody just thinks, Oh, no stress, man. We're going to be just fine. Because guess what? We're going to float out of here on the first boat. And, and, and we're not going to have to face any of these things. Well, guess what? I don't know about you, but, you know, I believe this. I believe that if you're about to be in a battle, you better prepare your heart for battle. Is what I'm trying to say. And we may not even have to see any of these things. But, I, but listen, before we used to start playing a football game, and you know, if you watch Little League, I don't know what the coaches are like nowadays, but when I was young, before any coach ever slapped me in the head, my daddy did. He slapped me in the head with my helmet on. Bam! And I was like, what in the world was that for? You need to get your head right, boy. You're about to get up. As soon as you step onto the gridiron, you need to understand that you, you know, then get your head right. And what I'm trying to say is, is that we, you and I need to be prepared for battle. Amen. Should battle come? Now, I'm not here to strike fear because, listen, i got to tell you that the answer to everything is the Lord. Amen. Right. And what i got to tell you is this, is that if God can get the Apostle Paul through dying for Christ, and if he can get other, you know, Mark and Thomas, Peter, Stephen. all the church fathers, if he can get them through it, okay, he can get you and I through it. Amen. But what we're going to have to come to the realization is this, is that we're either going to serve the Lord or we're not. And it's getting more and more tricky. Listen, I'm, not, I don't, I, I'm, gonna, I'm getting some stuff out before we start on these slides, but I want to make a point. That listen, whether you got the vaccine or not, this is not a vaccine issue. They're coming out with, they may come out with a Novavax shot, and if they do, I might take that shot because it's more traditional. I ain't about the mRNA. If you took the mRNA shot, I'm not like making like trying to give you a hard time and poke you. I'm just trying to tell you that there's various reasons that I didn't want to take the shot, period. Done deal. I gave many opportunities if y'all ever wanted to come talk to me and talk to come talk to me. But this is the point. The, the point is this, is that already they have pushed. That's the problem I have, is the way that they're pushing the globe towards having you have to do this. Well, what are you talking about? I'm an American citizen. Since when do I have to do anything? If I'm truly free and living in liberty, why do I have to do something? 
something that you say I have to do. Well, do we even get, have to get into statistics and see? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, come on, man. Yes, people die, but people die from the flu every year. All right, let me, let me not. I didn't mean to get into that. The point that I'm trying to make is they're going to create an atmosphere. This is not accidental, my friend. You got to be right. This is not accidental. This is, and this is a moment in the world history like never before. And I'm telling you right now, this is just the first leg of the journey. I, pro I can promise you that moving forward, they're going to find new ways. Listen, they're already working on something called digital ID. Back in digital ID 2020, that's the next thing that's coming around the landscape. And that's to be the next thing that they do. We got a little bit of it here because the mark is beast, okay? Digital ID 2020, and that's going to be the next thing. Did you notice that during the pandemic, we don't take cash? What are you talking about you don't take cash? We don't have enough change. What are you talking about you don't have enough change? It's all, it's all being prepared. Chips and credit cards, chips and this, chips and that. And, you know, now you don't even have to use a tapping card. Maybe you just run by pop. Right, and, you know, and listen, it's all being prepared. All of this fintech stuff, financial techno technology, it's all being prepared to move humanity. Yeah, yeah, it seems cool, man. I go my Apple Watch on there, boom, and my money gets transferred from my account through my Apple Watch. All the young people will love that stuff, man. Woo, swipe. Yeah, okay, but guess what? And they, I don't have a problem with that. I got my card on my iPhone. I haven't figured out how to tap it yet, but my point is, I don't have a problem with technology. I got a problem with where technology is bringing us, and I got a problem with people that don't have their eyes open to be prepared and understand that humanity is being pushed in a certain direction. All right, so with that said, let's take a look at some of this here. So Revelation 13 and 1 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So listen, overall, this beast, his, his MO, his plan is to blaspheme the name of God. And look, Satan's agenda has always been to blaspheme. And what does it mean? It means to slander, and it means to detract or take away from. Listen, if you go all the way back to the garden, and you hear what Satan told Eve, he said, in the day that you eat thereof, you will not die. God just doesn't want you to understand that you're going to gain knowledge and you're going to become as really like what he was saying as, as one of us. You're going to become as gods. Little G, gods, fallen angels, demonic spirits, okay? Those that are worshipped by other cultures that don't know any better. And so he, that's, what, that's what the enemy's plan has always been, is to slander the name of God. And everybody that works for the devil, that's what they do. They slander the name of God, okay? And, but I want you to see, we talked about this before, that this beast, and we're going to get into it a little bit again tonight, this beast is not only a system, it's a system of multiple nations, okay, when it's all said and done, but it's also a person. The beast is the Antichrist. So I want you to understand that. And, and this beast, now you got to understand this is a vision. This is a visual thing. And you can imagine like a seven-headed dragon, right? Because he calls him also the dragon. But he's got seven heads and he's got ten horns. And upon his horns, ten crowns. And upon his heads, the name blasphemy. Crowns represent kings and authority. Heads represent leadership and authority. And I need you to understand this beast system has seven heads, okay, and that, and the ten the ten horns represent power, and the crowns upon them represent kings that are connected to this. All right. Now I just want you to hold on to that. I want you to see because I mean, if you look at a dragon, it's like it's like a riddle. The whole thing, like, and I'm not even saying you're going to understand it completely tonight when we walk out of here. I've been studying this stuff for years. And God had to, like, open up my eyes for me to even be willing to go venture outside of what everybody else was teaching me, okay? And so what I'm trying to tell you is it's like a riddle, but God wants you and I to know. And as we approach the end and get even closer, he really, really, really wants us to know, okay? And so I want you to see that. So this beast, and really you could say the Antichrist, in a sense, came up out of the ocean. And look, you can't. And I wanted, to, I wanted to compare this because, look, moving forward, when we get to Revelation 17... See, I just put a Revelation 17 up there. You may not be able to see it because it's kind of small. It says in Revelation 17, 3, He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit on a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy. 
And she, this is the beast she's sitting on. The beast had seven heads and ten horns. So I wanted you to see it's the same beast. Now, in, in, in Revelation 17, when we get to it, we'll break it down. The heart of it. So, and, it, and so this, this mother of harlot, well, what does a harlot do? A harlot, a harlot tries to take the attention of a man, right? Away, and, and theoretically, if you, look at the, if you look at the story of God, Jesus is the bridegroom. The father is preparing a wedding for his son, Jesus. And the bride is those that are going to come to the marriage and be willing to marry themselves to the Lord Christ Jesus. That's, that's the concept that's in the Word of God. So the harlot is her that comes around deceitfully to pull the bride, to pull, to, to mess up the marriage, if we could just say it like that. To mess the whole thing up, to bring in deception, right? And so what I need you to know is that this mother of harlots, we're not even there yet, that'll be in a few weeks. This mother of harlots is producing... Religion. She's giving birth to religion. So she's like a madam, whatever you want, however you want to say it. She's a madam of false religion. She is, listen, those in the occult, you know what they call Lucifer? They call him Lucifer or Lucifer. Because he goes both ways. Oh, don't even get me started on that. You think this just showed up yesterday? No, 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 no. This stuff been around. The seeds of the things that are taking place in the earth today that young people are completely buying into. Can I, let me just say a story. I'm not even going to tell you which clinic I was at the other day. So I said, oh, you've been seeing me. Guess who's trans? I'm like, oh. I said, and immediately the Lord said, this is not a time for you to preach. This is a time for you to sit back and listen so you can learn. Well, tell me who's trans. I am. Oh, okay. Well, do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? How did that happen? How did that start? Oh, when I was about seven years old, I noticed that I like girls more than I like boys. And there was always this voice in my head that was sounded more manly than the voice that you hear here. I mean, obviously it was a lot that I could say there, but it I'm like, oh, okay. And then, her, and then all of a sudden, somebody that's there says, we want a pregnancy test. I'm like, oh, okay. So we want to pray. So you have a boyfriend? Yes. And so I was like, okay. And your boyfriend's homosexual. Yes. Now, stop. What? Stop the presses. What just happened there, my friend? Oh, but you got to understand, Mr. Mack, one thing is my sexual identity, the other one is my identity. I identify myself as trans, and I like girls, but I've got a boyfriend, and he's homosexual. Oh, my God. Wow. That's now, is it just for a shock value to see if that can shock some old man that's got a gray head? You're going to have to get up early in the morning to shock me, baby, because I've been around a little bit. And, and it, but what it really is, is a spirit of confusion. Amen. And the world is buying in because they want young people to be confused. Okay? I'm here to tell you, like, this, this stuff comes straight from Satan. I know they're going to take me off. Of, if anybody was watching, they'd take me off. I've already been labeled a problem. <laughs> okay, but nevertheless, I'm just here to tell you what this is. This is an agenda of the enemy. And so look, this harlot that's riding this beast, she's popping out all these false religions, Buddhism, Krishna, Allah, uh, you know, various forms of the church, lies and deception within the church. Anything that he, she, Lucifer, Lucifer can produce to get people's eyes all of the one true way. How you know you got the right way? Because every other way is saying, I got to do something to get there. The one that I hold on to said, he already did it for me. Because he was the righteous one. I was the sinful one. And he gave himself as a sacrifice Hallelujah. for my sin. And the word of God says, it was proven because he came busted up on the ground. Because like we got started, ain't no grave going to hold his body down. Ain't no grave. I wish I could sing. You get the point. <laughs> That's the heart. She's lying. All right? All right. But I want you to see this is verse 2 right here in Revelation 13. It says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear. His mouth was the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So already underlying leopard, I'm underlining bear, and I'm underlining lion because I've told you that this beast is also a group of nations and, and it's also ultimately going to be culminate in the fulfillment of one man the antichrist who's going to have power over the nations 
But what I want you to understand is that these, this plan of the enemy has been in place for thousands of years. Really, the plan of the enemy has been in place since the garden. God gave truth to Adam and Eve, and the enemy immediately came in and gave a lie. And he's always been doing that same kind of thing ever since. All right? And so I want you to know that leopard, bear, and lion, we can see whenever we already have been to Daniel, that Daniel talked to us about a lion. And what he said was that the lion represented Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, which was Babylon. And Daniel also said in that chapter 7 that Persia represented a bear. All right? And he also said in that chapter that, that Greece was represented by a leopard. But he also said that there was a, another beast that had great iron teeth, and that was Rome. Okay, And so what we see here is now we have four nations that are part of this seven-headed beast because I'm trying to explain to you where I get my information from on why I believe the seven-headed beast is nations that have been in existence and ultimately will produce the kingdom of the Antichrist. Okay, And I'm explaining to you why I believe that. First of all, based on the passage you just read in Revelation 13 compared to Daniel 7, I believe that we see that these kingdoms were already in existence. And listen, one of the things I want to tell you about these kingdoms here, you know what they all had in common? They were coming against God's kingdom, corporately, as nations. So what I need you to understand, too, is, is we're going to get into it a little bit more when we get there. This harlot that's right in the back of this seven-headed beast, this beast represents corrupt governments. The harlot represents lying religion, and she's been in communion. And guess what they've been doing? They've been lying to the world for thousands of years to bring deception upon humans. And it's said that the inhabitants of the earth are drunk with her fornication. Her lies and her sin and her deceit have made human beings drunk. All right? Daniel 7, verses 3 through 7. Let's take a look at that real quick. Daniel 7, verses 3 through 7. It says, And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I mean, all the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and the man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, the second like to a bear, it was raised up itself on one side. It had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and had great iron teeth. It devoured it and it broke in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet thereof. Now, when we studied Daniel, we, we, we explained why. Because Daniel actually gives three different prophecies. That's just one of them. The first one he gave explained in more detail who these nations were that were coming. Okay, so Daniel prophesied Babylon. He prophesied Persia. He prophesied Grecia. He prophesied Rome. Okay, and he prophesied that there would be other kingdoms that would come out of this. All right? So then it said in that passage that we read about the dragon, and it said that the dragon gave power. So, I mean, it's not, I don't think I have to convince you that part, who the dragon is, but just so that we're all on the same page, the word of God says in Revelation 20, later on, he laid hold, this is talking about our archangel, laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So the Bible says the dragon is Satan himself. Now listen, it says that the beast gets his power from the dragon. Now, I'm not trying to compare, but in a way, it's interesting to see. It's not so much a, for the purpose of comparison as much as it is to point out the counterfeit nature of Satan. See, God has a kingdom, and God has people in his kingdom. And God, through the Holy Spirit, uses people, sometimes little bitty guys like me, sometimes bigger people with bigger mouth, bigger bigger audience. And what the Holy Spirit does is he speaks the truth of God through those people and has been doing that for thousands of years. And the Holy Spirit, through the truth that's spoken, moves on the hearts of people and he's scooping people up and he's delivering them from the bondage of sin and he's pulling them out of the world because, see, what people think is that they want to be in the world. Yeah. 
People think that they want to be in the world because the world makes itself look very glamorous and very glitzy. And it's kind of like, man, you ain't really lived till you drove a, for, a, you know, I don't know. I, mean, I had an old friend that had a convertible Porsche. I mean, we were riding around laughing at 19 years old. And he's over here and he's got his convertible. And like, man, dude, you talk about, oh, man, 18, 19 years old, riding around with my boy in his convertible Porsche, riding up and down the streets. And this dude could drive like mad skills, like flipping 180 and we're going the other way. And everybody's like, hey, dude, what's up? You're so cool. Yeah, that's the world. Blitz and glamour. You know, how many, I mean, I'm not trying to be weird, but how many girls want to talk to you if you're in a Porsche? They'd rather talk to somebody in a Porsche than somebody in, well, my Hyundai. <laughs> like, Thank God. That's, that's a good reason to drive a Hyundai, right? I mean, my life would be okay with it. But the, so the point that I'm trying to make is, is that the world is presenting itself like, man, this is what you need. You got to get you some of this, yeah. right? Whatever it is, if it's a Porsche or whatever it is, if the world says it looks good, we have a tendency to believe them and, and to walk over there. Okay, you got me convinced. I want to go the way you're going, even though it's going to lead to destruction and death and heartache and sorrow. And the Lord came in riding lowly on a donkey. See, the gospel is different, all right? But the dragon gives power, just like the Holy Spirit, through the finished work of Christ, gives power to his people to speak truth. And then the anointing of the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart, whoever you are, wherever you are. And he will say, the boy's right, you know. He's telling the truth, and the Holy Spirit will make your heart flutter or cause you to, to realize, I'm hearing truth right now. However God chooses to do it, he will reveal truth to you because he loves you. Amen. I can preach that with all boldness because I know the God I serve loves you and he wants you to hear and to know the truth. And in a similar fashion, Satan gives power to his kingdom in order to bring deception. See? Hopefully that makes sense. Revelation 13, 3, I saw one of his heads and they were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed in all the world wondered after the beast. So we hear that it had seven heads, and it says that one of the heads is wounded. Just as a side note, many people believe, many people don't believe that there will be a literal man that will be antichrist. They believe that the system is antichrist, and they believe the heads represent only nations. And they say that one of the interpretations is that the head will be a kingdom that loses its power. That's the mortal head wound, and that it regains power under the dominion of the antichrist. I say, why can't it be both? <laughs> Like, in other words, it's a seven-headed kingdom. One of them is a new kingdom that's going to come, and I'll show you that in a sec, that has ten crowns, because we said it had ten thrones, right? Ten kings. And why can't it be? And those are actually representative of ten nations within the last seventh kingdom. I know it gets confusing. Okay? And why can't it be like one of those nations starts to lose power, and the leader, it, he, they give power to the Antichrist, and the Antichrist, see, this is the reason I can't prove it, but I believe, I believe it's prophecy through Scripture, okay, and, and that the Antichrist dies, a fake resurrection takes place. That, that's what it's saying, huh? that, that he dies. Yes, it says that, it says, and as it were, one of it, one, as of his heads, talking about the beast, were, one of the heads was wounded to death. Yes, so it's saying that he died. Okay, and, but, it, but then he comes. Healed. But then he's healed, back. so he comes back. And so what I'm trying to say is that some people try to say, I, I, "Why do I even tell you all these angles?" Because you, if you yeah, study, you're going to come across it. So I put all this into this message, okay? But I'm saying a lot of times, and again, I'm going to say it again, and I'm not even saying that this is how it's going to happen. But they cloned Dolly in 1980. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all know. Y'all yep. know yeah. Who's Dolly? Dolly was a sheep, dude. And in 1985, they genetically created a sheep named Dolly out of the cells of another sheep. You ain't heard about it again. She was alive, dude. Man, man. She was alive walking around. And you know what they said? They said, oh, but it would be against human law to create another human being. Do you, you, you believe them? Whoever they are, I don't believe them. So what are you trying to say for you? I'm trying to say they could easily call me a human being. That's in right. In 2022. Mm -hmm. What a perfect scenario, yes. I heard, and it's been a while, the shroud of Jesus that they found at his grave. Anyway, they were saying that the DNA, someone was just hypothetically talking about this, that possibly 
the DNA from his straw thing um, that they cloned. Oh. They tried to clone him. It's, hey, yeah. it's possible. Who knows? I mean, that's we're getting. That's kind of yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. And I mean, those are the kind of things that you'll find if you study. I mean, we're getting deeper and deeper yeah. into speculation, <laughs> but it's okay. I'm just okay. okay, we're still kind of speculating a little bit, but we're speculating based upon stuff in the scripture. Meaning, we know the devil is a counterfeiter, done deal. Yeah. And we know that Jesus resurrected from the dead. Amen. So why would he not try to counterfeit? And then I'm just trying to speculate how he might try to pull that off based on technology that we already know exists. You understand what I'm saying? But what's interesting to me is if you're calling a human being, do they, are they a living soul? Because see, the, because see, Adam was formed out of the dust of the earth. God breathed his breath into the nostrils of Adam and made him a living soul. And all the offspring of Adam now are the descendants of that first man that God created. So if they take cells from something else and they create it themselves, does it have a soul? No. That, that would seem like that would be a perfect vessel for a demon spirit to live. Amen. Okay, but anyway. All right, so so nevertheless, his his his, his head wound is healed, right? Um, and 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 so he lives again. All right, and they worship the dragon. Now I didn't really plan on getting into this, but I thought about it earlier when I was studying. This is really and truly what the dragon is all about. He's just trying to steal the worship of God. He, even like look, he'll get whatever he can get out of you. I'm just saying. I don't know if this kind of stuff offends people. And hopefully anybody that knows me, and if you don't know me, trust me, I say things that I know are going to offend people, but it's not to purposely offend people. All right? I say it because I believe it to be true. When I showed y'all a picture the day after Mardi Gras, I said, did y'all enjoy y'all's parades? I hope you didn't. And the picture I showed you was a picture of, of Satan on the front, basically a picture of Lucifer, all pretty looking with his horns and his wings on the front of the float and the crowd on the side with their hands lifted up like throwing something, mister. See, the dragon wants to be worshipped and, and if he can just get a little something, something out of you going to a, a Mardi Gras parade, if that's all he's ever going to get out of you, he'll take whatever he can get out of you, my friend. And he'll bring it all the way up to the next level to where he's like, if you sell me your soul, then I will make you better than any man hated or something like that. Something, you know, whatever. Okay, I believe that. I do. I believe that that is true. Alright, now, I'm just trying to say, he's trying to steal the worship of God. The dragon wants to be worshipped. And in the end, just like God allows worship to funnel through Jesus, the dragon is going to allow worship to funnel through the beast. Alright, which gave power to the beast. They worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So they worship the beast. Alright. Here it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, saw a beast rise up out of the sea, and had seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. The heads are nations, right? I've already made that point. Amen. The heads are nations. And now look, I'm going, I'm going to backwards to go forwards. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. All right, that's six. I'm trying to make a point. Because look, well, I'm not trying to get too far ahead of myself because we're going to teach this again in more detail when we get to Revelation 17. But the conclusion that I've come to, how I say that the, that this beast, these seven heads of these beasts are nations, is because of the fact, and, and, and in order for it to equal seven, you got to have seven, because we already know Daniel told us about Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Daniel told us about those four. There were two, and Daniel was alive during all four of those kingdoms, except for Greece and Rome, and he prophesied about it. But there were two kingdoms that were in existence before Daniel was alive that were also against God. You see what I'm saying? And so what we're seeing is that the beast is a type, because it doesn't end here. It goes on and it fulfills itself for the end. But what I'm trying to get you to understand is, is that every... All these nations on the early end were types of that which was to come. And that this seven-headed beast is the time when it's coming to its fulfillment. So Egypt was against God's kingdom and held the people in bondage, right? Assyria took the northern kingdom in 726 BC. Babylon took the southern kingdom. Okay, then it went to Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now listen. Many people, and you can go do your own research, but the United Nations and NATO and all of that comes from supposedly something called the Treaty of Rome. Right. 
when I, then whenever you look at Rome and the Vatican, and the, listen, I'm just, gonna, I'm just being real with you. Does that mean that all Catholics are, no, I know a lot of Catholics that love God. I was born and raised Catholic, okay? But a lot of people are deceived. Period. Done deal. I'm about to get into worse with it here in a second. But I'm trying to make a point that, that guess what? Rome even, it says that it, in, in, when we get to Revelation 17 again, it says that the, 70, the seven heads are not only seven kings, but it also represents seven hills. Weirdly enough, Rome is built on seven hills. It's known as the city of seven hills. I'm not here to make this stuff. All right? And so what I'm trying to tell you is, is that the seven, you see here we got six. One, two, three, four, five, six. The sixth is that kingdom of ten kings. Does that make sense? On the, you, remember, you, you heard when we read it at the beginning. Seven heads, ten crowns. Later on when we get to Revelation 17, it says that the ten kings is a kingdom that has not come yet. And when it comes, they will give their power to the beast. Alright? So, the, the, the new kingdom is coming from Rome. It's coming, it's coming from the old Roman Empire, a revitalized Rome of, ten, of a confederate of ten nations. Okay, does that make sense? And then the eighth, that it says that in Revelation 17, is going to be the kingdom of the Antichrist that comes out of one of these ten. All right, I hope that makes sense. All right, the kingdom of Antichrist. And so the kingdom of Antichrist comes out of this new, can I say it like this, revitalized Roman Empire that's going to be constructed of 10 nations. I don't know how many is in the UN right now or in NATO, but at some point in time, I believe there's going to be that number right there. Some kind of way, somehow, it's going to work out. All right. Okay. So, verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given to him to continue for 42 months, which is also 3.5 years. I just showed you this Daniel passage because Daniel prophesied that in the end, this specific king. So Daniel, the interesting thing about Daniel is he's like 580 years before Jesus was ever born. And Daniel prophesied about the Antichrist like 500 and something B.C. And that's what he said. That there's going to be a king. He's going to exalt himself. He's going to magnify himself above every god, God. And he will speak marvelous things against the God of gods. And look what it says. It says... And, and, shall, and he shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. Look at this. I underline that. For that that is determined shall be done. <laughs> you know what that means? What, what does that mean? It says, and he's going to prosper. Who's he? The beast and in Christ. He's going to prosper until the indignation is accomplished. In other words, until he's destroyed. Why, why are you saying that, Daniel? Because that that is determined. In other words, that which God said... It's going to be done. What God said is going to happen in his word. Yeah, we got to dig deep to find it. See, some of you might have just accidentally stumbled up in this place. I'm just saying. Or you might have accidentally showed up on the video. I mean, that's, that's legit. That could happen. Like, you know, somebody, you, you, you just showed up in this place. But what you did was you showed up in a place where people, at least the preacher, believes the word of God. I believe the word of God so much that I've devoted years of my life to dig by his grace to find out what are you really trying to say, Lord? What are you trying to say? Because if your word is true, I got to know it. Because it's a road map for this life and the next. Amen. I believe that, my friend. Amen. All right. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. I want you to just look at that verse for a second. Because look, it says, it says right there, it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Now, we've already discussed this, but I'm going to bring it up again. The truth that who are the saints? Because you see, look, if you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, there ought not be no saints here. That's right. Yeah, they would say that some of these saints could, could be, you know, people that maybe got saved after yeah. the rapture. Okay, that's, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. But, but, but what, what I need you to know is, is that he is going to overcome some believers, whoever they are, whatever it is. It says it right here. He overcomes them. Now, in a certain sense, whenever people believe that, that, that believers are being overcome, listen, you got to understand, would you say that Paul was overcome? Yeah. In the end, when he got his hand cut off? Kind of, sort of, but not exactly. 
Which is saying that, that Mark was overcome when he was drugged through the streets of Egypt on a chariot? Kind of, sort of, but not exactly. He was overcome in that moment. He was killed. His physical body was killed. But he rose in glory. Amen. He rose in victory. Hallelujah. Amen. Does that make sense? That's what I'm trying to say. So I uh, just want you to be reminded. of that. And all that dwell on the earth shall worship him. At least those whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, the reason why I'm going through all of this and my face is all red and I'm all passionate and I'm trying to get everybody to listen is because if the numbers are right and, and, and the position that I've been trying to make is right and the 1,335 days brings you 75 days into the wrath of the beast, it's going to be ugly, my friend. And it says right here, all those that dwell on the earth are not written in the book of life. Now, there's a couple of things I want to tell you about the book of life. Number one, there is a book called the book of life, and it's the book of the Lamb, and it's in heaven. And I don't know exactly how it works, because I haven't been up there. I can read about it in some different spots. But what I need you to know is this, is that your name is not written in the book of life until you give your heart to Jesus. That's, right. That's how you get your name written in the book of life. Amen. Somebody at some point in time tells you the good news of the gospel. Maybe it was Robert. Some of y'all know Robert. Maybe Robert was out there because Robert told a lot of people about Jesus. And he told somebody about Jesus and they, and it, and it, and it kind of like made their ears twitch a little bit. And they said, well, hey, I need to know more about this Jesus. Robert said, well, let's pray. And if you pray from your heart, meaning you get business with God, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. The Bible says that the Spirit of God came to live on the inside of you. And guess what? As soon as the Spirit of God was entering on the inside of you, guess what was happening? I don't know for sure if it goes this way, but I, I can see it. There's an angel up there. Boom. He wrote your name in the book of life. Your name's been written in the book of life if you're born again tonight. If you are not born again, how do I get born again? Preaching is real simple. Jesus, save me, Lord. Do you have to do it exactly like I did? No, I'm, I'm a dramatic person. I'm trying to make a point. It can be like this. Jesus, yes. I'm driving home. Jesus, is what that man said true? Yes. I felt something in my heart. Jesus, is that it, 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 it Was he telling the truth? If he was, would you, would you show me? Yes, what, yes, would you come into my heart? Would you, would you forgive me? Would your spirit live in me? Would you change me? I just want to know the truth, but I don't want to be deceived. Yes. I don't want to be deceived. Yes, Lord. Don't you change me? Now, let me tell you something. If you get real with God, God will get real with you, my friend. Now, that doesn't mean that the battle is because the devil won't try to mess you up. <laughs> the devil is going to constantly try, for lack of better words, to jack you up, to railroad you, and to put you on the detour. He ain't going to quit. He's the worst fight you ever want to be in because he will never quit. You hear me? He's worse than a pit bull. Trust me. Alright? But that's okay. Because you serve the one that is much bigger Amen. than him. He that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. It don't matter the tactics and the tricks and whatever Satan God, God trumps him. Amen? Amen? And God will give you what I need in order to be victorious. Amen. And you know what victorious is for me? I'm going to tell you right now. Victorious for me is, is that one day I'm walking on the streets of gold. And then, I hear, and then the Lord walks up to me and he says, well done, my good and faithful yes, You stay true. Oh, you didn't do it all right. You messed up. You looked at some stuff you shouldn't have looked at. You probably took part of some things you shouldn't have taken part in. And that's not what I'm talking about. You stayed true to me and you served me and my blood. And you finally got to a place where you didn't want to sin anymore like you used to want to sin because I convinced myself to you that I was real and that I loved you and that my blood was shed for you so that you didn't have to live in the bondage of sin. You finally got to that place and you still made some mess up along the way. But praise God, you made it. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Amen. I want to hear those words. But there's going to be some people whose names are not written in the book of life. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to worship him. They're going to worship that dragon, that beast. I believe that this scripture right here tells us the kind of things that are going to be going on during that time frame. It says, he that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. 
He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Those two words right there, captivity and sword, I believe in those last days. Listen, there's going to be only one, one to two answers for some people. I mean, who knows exactly how it's going to go down. But, but you're, you're going to make a choice in that time, right? So you're going to have to make a choice. You're either going to live for the Lord or, um, you know, or you're going to give in to, to the plan of the enemy. And if you're going to live for the Lord, then, then one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to snatch you out and bring you where they want you to go, captivity, or they're going to kill you with weapons. And then it says that those that are going to be willing to go into captivity, and then those that are going to kill with the sword, are going to die. With so you really, well, preacher, do you have a do you have a stance on this? I got a stance on this. You're an American citizen. You got a right to bear arms. If you got arms in your house. Bear your arms, my friend, but what you got to understand is you ain't going to take down <laughs> the third red or whatever it is, the National Guard or whoever, the SWAT team or the UN soldiers when they bombard you out. Yeah, I mean, you try to, I mean, I'm just being a realist here. I don't want people to think that I'm recommending you shoot. When it comes down to the nitty gritty, when this thing goes down, if, but you're not going to win. If you'd rather go, that way, then to allow them to take you to prison, I guess, protect your property. I don't know what the answer is, but I'm just trying to tell you, this is how it's going to be going now. Either captivity or you die, because we don't even know if this is going to happen during our life. Amen? All right. Y'all with me? Amen. Yep. Then I beheld another beast. So the first one is the Antichrist. Coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. So he looks like a lamb. But he speaks like a dragon. Mm -hmm. So when you look at him, you think, oh, look at that. And the lamb is, is the connotation of the sacrifice. I mean, that's what the Bible language, right? So you would get the idea, oh, he's somebody that maybe represents God. Yeah. But when he speaks, it's the language of the dragon. Mm -hmm. He exercises all the power of the first beast before him. He causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, I got this picture of Hitler right here. Now, I, listen, I want to be clear about this. I am not trying to say that this is the way it's going to go down. I've said that before. I'm trying to say this is an example of how it could be. Because, listen, Antichrist is going to be a world leader. The second beast is the false prophet. So it's going to be a world leader, and it's going to be a religious icon that people will follow. All right, now, I have a lot more ammunition than this, and I'm not going to really bring it right now, but I'm just making a point. Here's a picture. That's Hitler. You know him. This is actually Pope Pius XII. Pope Pius XII was also known as Hitler's Pope. The reason why it was is because he ruled, he was the pontiff during the time frame of Hitler. His name was Pius XII. But what I need you to understand is, is that hidden within the crevices of history, there was another man. His name was Cardinal B. Cardinal B was the cardinal of Germany that helped Hitler rise to power. Cardinal B was also the personal confessor of Pius XII. What does that mean? Pius XII, this is what I need you to do. He was a Jesuit priest, Jesuit trained. We ain't got time to get into the Jesuits, do your own homework. And he had the he had the ear of the Pope. And he was the cardinal of Germany and helped get Hitler elected. All right, so what is my point? My point is, is that what you have here is a world ruler and a religious leader. And all I'm trying to say is, is that I see this being kind of like a snapshot of what it will look like in the end. Are you saying that the false problem is going to be the Pope? I personally believe yes. I'm not going to shoot that. I could have gone this far. I personally believe yes, but I can't prove that. All right? All right, so anyway. Does that mean that all Catholics are bad? Of course not. I told you I was born and raised Catholic. I was christened a Catholic. But what I'm trying to say is, it is an ancient Babylonian religion. Google Babylonian prayer beads. Google uh, the tonsure of the monks, that little sun disc that they put on their head. Google thing after thing. Google the Pope's hat and how it looks like the Babylonian gods in Nineveh when they did the archaeology. So just do your homework. Don't, don't get mad at me. Revelation 13, 13. He does great wonders so that he may 
makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. All right. And he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword or some type of weapon, I believe, and did live. So make an image to him. This is kind of like a new little shift in gears in here. Now, I, in this particular scripture, it says, and he gave power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast would speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast that they should be killed. All right. Now, in this particular passage of scripture, I'm not going to turn there because I keep it. I have it here for another 15 minutes. All right. I'm going to try to wrap it up. But in this passage of scripture, if you go back and you read it, it's the story in Daniel of King Nebuchadnezzar and the golden image that he had made. This image was, if you do the math on it, 60 feet tall, 6 feet wide, so 60 plus 6 is 66, and there were 6 musical instruments, 666, six, six. and whenever the music would play, it said, all you nations and kindreds and tongues, when you hear the sound of the music of the 6 instruments, fall down on your face and worship this golden image that represents Nebuchadnezzar. And if you don't, then you're going to be killed. You're going to be thrown into the fire. Y'all remember the story? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Hebrew boys, amen? And they threw him in the fire. And guess what the king said? We threw three people in there, but I see a fourth one. And it looks like the son of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Good news, my friend. It don't matter whether they throw you in the fire or not. Hallelujah. God, Jesus is going to be with you. I am a step of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. It also be there to help some people escape. Amen. All right. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Y'all ever heard this before about the mark? Yep. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, no matter who you are, no matter how much money you have, no matter what the color of your skin is, it don't matter what, how many languages you speak. It, 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 he's going to cause people to receive a mark in their right hand and their forehead. And without it, you can't, you can't somehow, without this mark, you can't do any kind of financial transaction. All right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I've been studying stuff to try to figure this out. You know, like, what does this mean? You know what I mean? Bridget gave me a couple of books that showed in that barcode thing, and I believe that's legit that they got the number 666 embedded in there. That started way back before the 80s when they were already scanning, started putting barcodes. Some of you people so so young, y'all don't even realize we've been alive. Like, we the little squiggly lines that are on every piece of food that you buy, that stuff came about back when, when I was alive, back when I was a teenager. And I remember I could hear the people talking about it. Oh, they got six, six, six in there. I'm like, man, I'm crazy, dude. It does. Man, like, don't mess up my buzz, bro. Y'all <laughs> tripping. Yeah, that, that's how I used to I'm just telling you how I used to do it. I don't want to hear all that, man. I believe it. it they've been working on this thing, right? Okay, but listen. Somehow they will put whatever this system is in the right hand in, in, or in the head. And without it, you're not going to be able to do financial transactions. So... You know, like I mentioned to you earlier about this digital ID 2020, and they were talking about how this, there's a global initiative. To, there's one million people on the planet that don't have any form of ID, and that you, the other six billion, need to be concerned about your global brethren, and y'all need to be willing to give into digital identification. And it's going to start off as a little card. They're already doing it in India. They're already doing it in a company called in Estonia. I might have said that wrong, but an Eastern European country. I watched the conference. It was on a video, and it was it was a legit conference. It had a Microsoft representative because, of course, Bill Gates is involved in that, too. And they're working on all this technology. Okay? And so it's going to be some type of an identification, but it's also going to be interconnected some kind of way to your financial system. I don't know how all this is going to work, but I'm just telling you. So, you know, whenever the shot first came out, everybody was saying, oh, it's the market of peace. No, it ain't. Like, you don't just get jabbed with a shot and then accidentally now you have the market of peace. It don't work that way. First of all, it's not just going to be a financial situation. I just don't want nobody telling me what I ought to do. Amen. And other reasons that I would tell you. 
Anyway, <laughs> they're going to interconnect this digital identification. It's going to have all your health care records on it. It's going to be able to transact financially. And maybe there'll be a shop connected to it sometime in the future. Or maybe that's just the next leg in the journey. Oh, no, you're going to get your shot. And then you're going to get your digital identification to prove you got your shot. And if you don't, guess what? We formed a new type of currency, and it's digital. And if you ain't got this little jiggle jig, guess what? You can't make no transaction. Oh, you got some money that you took out your bank and you buried it in the grass? Guess what? Bad news, my friend. You can't even spend that kind of money. That's anymore. right. It's coming. I bought a little bit of silver one time. I need to buy some more, maybe. But I don't know. Will silver be able to buy a loaf of bread? I don't know. I don't know what. I hope I ain't around for all that, but I'm just trying to say. All right. So when it comes to this mark, you know, me and Aaron had a conversation one time uh, about the mark and how, you know, it could be one of these RFID deals. It's like a little pellet that they stick because I think my dog has one. It's got all their information on there. I brought it to the vet and they scan it. And they say, oh, yeah, you got this shot, you got that shot, da, 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 da. And she goes, mm, whatever kind of dog and blah, blah, blah. And so they can scan all that stuff. All right. Well, I remember Aaron making a point that he said, man, I don't think it's going to be that. I don't know. I'll probably even try to argue with him. But you don't know. He said, I think it's going to be more like a tattoo, like a mark. Oh, man. Scott Bailey sent me this little video. I was looking at it the other day. Late at night when I, when I was getting ready to leave somewhere. And look at this. Let's see if it worked. Let's hope it worked. This is a, this is a video that was produced by Rice University. Okay, y'all ever heard of Rice? Where's that located? Houston. Is it in Houston? Houston, Texas. All right, so this is a university-created video. Now, it just so happens, I know you occult conspiracy theorists, that the owl is interconnected to the occult because of wisdom and darkness, and it can see in the night. But guess what? That's the that's the mascot. Now, maybe there's more to it, but I don't know. But anyway, let's see. Hopefully, I can tap this in it. Ah, now I can. Okay, let's see. Ah, there we go. There it goes. All right. Hopefully. Today we'll make graphene on many different substrates. Previously, we could only make graphene on materials that, that were like uh, polyimide, a particular type of polymer. But now what we found is by tuning the liver a little bit differently and deepening the laser, which first carbonizes the material and then we take the carbonized material and convert it into the graphene. So what you see here is you don't see ink. This is not ink. This is not the addition of ink to a material. This is taking the material itself, the wood itself, and convert it into graphene. And the laser allows us to write it into any pattern that we wish. This is on a piece of wood. Or we can do it even on foods, like this is a potato. So remember what graphene is. It's these single atomic thick sheets of graphite, and that's taking and we put a few of them on top of each other as we convert the material itself, a piece of bread, and so you can convert the carbohydrates that are within bread to graphene, or we can do on a coconut, so you can use coconut and convert that into graphene. Now, why would we want to have something like this? This is all conducted. And so we can conduct electricity. So what we can do now is we can make electronics embedded within fabrics and make electronics embedded within wood. So right now we're going to be lighting a uh, cardboard box here. And the significance of being able to put electronic systems on cardboard boxes is, is that it has a lot of potential commercial significance in being able to write RFID tags directly on boxes so you can either test, tell where it's been or you can put a sensor on the box and choose what kind of conditions it's been exposed to. Currently, people are using RFID tags that have been manufactured and they've attached them to the boxes, but being able to directly convert a box would be really valuable. Why would one want edible electronics? Well, first of all, let me start with, very often we don't see the advantage of something early on. But when we make it available, people start seeing the real advantage. So can you even take have electronics embedded on food and then say, use this as a heat circuit to heat the food. More recently, to say an RFID tag written onto this potato. Where has it been? How long has it been stored? Where did, where, what, what's its country of origin and its city of origin? And what path did it go to to get to your table? All that can be embedded 
not on a separate tag that's placed on the food, but directly on the food itself. And these can also have sensors, sensors that can detect E. coli, sensors that can detect microorganisms that you might not want that could immediately light up and give you a signal that you don't want to eat this. So being able to barcode food, in a sense, could have real advantages. So, wow. anyway, it's pretty, uh, pretty crazy stuff, right? I mean, like, we could just go, we could probably talk about for hours about that, the implications of that kind of technology and what that can mean, right? Anyway, all right. So uh, let's take a look here. We're about to close this up. I think we only have um, a couple more slides. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Now listen, I want you to understand this is another scripture. This is not Revelation 13. This is in Revelation 14. But I wanted you to see the end result of for those people whose names weren't written in the Lamb's Book of Life and who took the mark of the beast, right? And again, that's why if the pre-tribulation rapture is not the right way to be believing, that's why it's so important to, to for us to understand that because that would mean that there may be a moment in history where believers, whether it's us or not, I don't know, may have to face a short period of time. Now, now this is consistent with the scripture where it said, if, where Jesus said, if that time were not shortened, even the elect would also be deceived. That's right. All right? So this doesn't build a congregation of people. As a matter of fact, it's more likely to make people not want to come back. But nevertheless, I'm not here to be a, in a popularity contest. I'm here to, to speak what I believe that God has called me to speak. All right. So in this particular chapter right here, it says, with a loud voice, if any man worships the beast in his image and receives his mark, this is what happens. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, I got to tell you that, you know, I've had conversations before, me and Rob went down a little rabbit trail a few years back with some Jehovah Witness people, but that was one of the things that me and this elder, this Jehovah Witness, uh, whatever you want to call it, they don't believe in eternal damnation. They don't believe in eternal judgment. They believe in something called soul sleep, and then they believe that ultimately you just kind of poof and you don't have to experience it anymore. And he was trying to say that I was preaching a message that, of demonic activity because that was fear. I said, sir, let me tell you what's, what's, that don't even make sense, sir. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but that don't even make sense. What's demonic is deception. Demons deceive people. It makes more sense that it's a de deceiving demonic message that says there's no such a thing as hell. And that people can live in your way they want. Anyway, let me, let me not go there. So, so it says, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. That's what this written, I, the scripture says that right there. It doesn't say that it's temporary. It doesn't say that it's a part-time gig. It says that when it happens, it's eternal. Now, I'm just telling you this. Even if you don't ever come back, even if you never watch the videos again, I just want to encourage you to know that if you happen to be alive when all this goes down, you need to understand that your choice is, I'm going to serve Jesus. Because I want you, I'm going to compare the next passage of Scripture to this one. Because, look, the torment is forever and ever. Now look at this is the, this is the next, forever and ever. I want you to see that. But look, here is the patience of the saints. There's that word saints again. The patience of the saints. Here is the endurance of the saints. See, during this time frame, the true saints, the true people of God, are going to have to endure. You, you're going to have to. People are going to have to make a decision, just like Peter made a decision. Just like Mark made a decision. Oh, you really want to say you saw Jesus raised from the dead? Because if, you, if you'll tell everybody over here you've been preaching that he didn't really raise from the dead, we'll let you go. No, Jesus raised from the dead, man. You want me to reject out of my mouth the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that I know he's been living in my heart for the last 30 something years or whatever? I'm not going to reject it by the grace of God. You're talking big enough, preacher wanted to come and grab you. Well, guess what? The same grace that helps me preach is going to have to be the same grace that helps me stand in the face of it. That's right. Because if it's left to me, 
thing, I will. I'll be a little scared cat. But now with the grace of the Lord, amen? amen. With the grace of the Lord, you stand strong. Yes. Right? right? Here is the patience of the saints. Here is the endurance of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Why do you think that the Lord will put that word in there? Whether you agree with me on timing or not, look at that wording right there. God wants you to know Whenever these people take a mark and they're tormented forever and ever, oh, by the way, here's the, in the next verse, I got a little word from, from the saints. Here's, the, here's your patience. Here's your endurance. While they're doing that, <laughs> you better be doing this. You better be holding on to me. Amen? All right. Praise God. All right. Here's wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score. And six, which we've already talked about the fact that that number is six, six, six. So we're about to close right here. This is the last slide. I'm ending on this. I'm trying to make a point that it said it. It's the number of a man. I want to bring you backwards in time just for a quick moment. Whenever the time of creation, I want you to know that man was created on the sixth day. That this number is interconnected to humanity. That whenever Satan deceived Eve in the garden, he said that in the day that you eat thereof, you will not die, but instead you shall become as gods. Trying to invoke the spirit of humanity to become God. Trying to evoke the spirit of humanity to not be happy with what God has given them, but to search for something more. Just, just as Satan did to the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness and God provided them manna and they said, we don't want this manna you're giving us. Manna represents the word of God. How many times people don't want the word of God? We don't want this word you're giving us. We want a different kind of word. We want something that's going to make us feel better or, or whatever. No, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. And God wants you and I to know, listen, mankind in the end, I don't know how you tie all this together, but Mankind has been throwing his lot in with the devil for thousands of years. It's going to come to, a, to the end. And this, and this whole system is, is really, it's the spirit of humanism, right? Y'all understand that part, the spirit of humanism, where, no, can I, just real quick, I'm, I'm just being three minutes. Whenever you, whenever you look at the stuff that's been slowly happening, and the way, and I mean, I know Sabrina had a dream about this, where in the dream, but it's, I mean, the dream, it's good to get dreams, because the word of God said before she ever got the dream, that, that there was going to be a time on the world where the spirit of deception was going to, well, basically what the word of God said, call good evil and call evil good. And so it's going to prepare an environment where people like you and I are going to be considered evil by the world. Well, yeah, we're already being considered evil. Mm -hmm. You say your way is the only way? How dare you? There's multiple ways to, to happiness in God. Well, how dare you say that this is wrong? These people just want to love somebody. How dare you say, I didn't say nothing was wrong. The word of the Lord said it was wrong. I know this is my bad. But, but the word of God said it was wrong. And I'm just repeating what God said. Oh, you believe that book is the word of God? You better believe it. The man wrote it. No, 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 no. The word of God says it's theonoustos. It's God breathed. Yes, God sir. breathed in man, through man, and gave his word to man. Yeah. I've been telling people, nurses over there at the hospital, see what this is the problem. This is what people want. People want God to flow down in all his glory. And they want to they want to believe in God through the scientific method. I want to start, I want to develop a hypothesis. God is true. Okay, now I need some physical evidence to prove it. And that's what you want, huh? Well, guess what? It ain't gonna happen, right? Oh, it's gonna happen one day, but it might be too late. He is gonna slow down in all his glory. He will return in like that and that he left. Just as he left with the child, he's coming back in the child. But guess what? He ain't gonna just do that for you. Yeah, he he's gonna do it when he wants to. I've heard stories of Muslim people seeing Jesus visit. Yeah. And then guess what? They get their heart to him. Guess what? He ain't gonna just do that for everybody. No, he said to Thomas, Thomas, he said, come on, Thomas, stick your finger in his hand right here. Go ahead, push your hand in my side. Thomas said, now I believe. He said, well, God, and he didn't say it like that. He's not quite like that. He, but he said, well, good for you, Thomas. But what about all the people that won't be able to see? 
and yet they still Let's will believe. believe. Yes. See, faith is the substance of things hoped for, yes. but the evidence of things unseen. Yes. God wants you and I to believe Him at His word yes. and to believe that He is true. Yes. And I got done going close with this. If you will believe Him at this word and you will invite Him into your heart yes. and you will ask forgiveness of your yes. sin, yes. amen, He will come to live oh, in your heart. Yes. He will change you. And if you will work with him, he will keep changing you. Amen. And every time that devil starts to tell you something to try to keep you out the house of God, you better know that's the devil lying to you. Amen. Maybe you've never prayed a prayer like that before. Maybe somebody watching on video, somebody in the house of God, just close your eyes with me right now. And if you want to just receive Jesus Christ, all you got to do is say, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe in my obsession. Come to my heart. Come into my heart and forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart, forgive me of my sins and teach me your ways. Lead me and guide me according to your spirit. Praise God. I believe somebody somewhere prayed that prayer. Let me just pray for you right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for this beautiful plan of salvation that you have provided your son to die for us. Your word says that if a man would believe in his heart and confess that belief with his mouth, that he would be saved. You said that when people call, hear the gospel and they respond through faith, that your spirit would come to live on the inside of them. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would witness to those that have prayed this prayer and make it real to their hearts and minds, that you truly have entered into them, that they now are the house where you live, oh Lord God. And I pray that you would speak to them and that they'd be able to hear your voice and that they would follow after your will and not their own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have a blessed week. Amen. Amen. Blessed week, bro.